<laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, I have a microphone and I have a clicker, but I'm gonna make this work. Um, first of all, thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Sarah, like Garrett said, and I'm really excited and honored to be at this conference. I have been programming for a long time, since 2001. In fact, uh, most recently I was programming uh, Python on Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. But I am a relative newcomer to Erlang. And so what this talk is gonna be, it's, it's gonna be talk about me learning Erlang through the context of a project in process that I've been working on. And specifically talking about it as someone who comes from a different language or sets of languages. So I'll first describe the project, um, then my initial prototypes, which were in Ruby, and then I will move on to Erlang and sort of what that looked like and what I learned. So um, I'm going to start the story on my birthday. So March 27th is my birthday, and a few years ago on March 27th, this venture capitalist wrote a blog post that intrigued me. And you should always, if you want to feel good about yourself, always read blog posts by venture capitalists on your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> really achieved things. Um, but he was talking about, um, he was engaged in a conversation about how there were a lot of new um, applications and networks that were springing up on our existing social networks. And he was discussing with a friend of his whether or not these new applications were actually networks in their own right. But more interesting to me than that was he, he framed our um, social networks as a sort of an operating system. He said, what if we think about our social networks as an operating system upon which we can build applications? And I thought that was just a super neat thing to think about, like just a, just a neat image. And my mind started going, and I thought, well, what could I build sort of on top of Facebook? Or what could I build on top of Twitter? Um, and I'm not a huge Facebook user, but I, I uh, love and use Twitter, or at least until the election. <laughs> And uh, now I try to stay away. But I think of it as sort of this giant rushing stream of consciousness, right? It's our thoughts. It's what we had for breakfast. It's news events. It's presidential events. It's like everything, and it's just rushing by. And so if you look at it from a high enough level, it's like this gigantic stream of disjoint words and ideas that we're all plugged into. Um, and so what can you build on top of a gigantic stream of rushing by random words? And I thought, well, you could build poetry. And not new made up poetry, like make it up, but existing literature. And so that became my question, which is, can existing poetry be found just skimming along the top of Twitter? So there, there's so many words going by at any given moment. So if you just dipped your hand in and pulled up a handful of like the current state of Twitter, and let the chaff fall away, could you be left holding a poem? Um, like, what if we had one of those fancy leaf skimmers that you all use for your LA vacation swimming pools, right? <laughs> like, what could you skim off of the top of Twitter? And so this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to take a leaf skimmer to Twitter and see what poetry I could pull off. Um, and I've, do you guys know the four quartets? Yeah. I've always, I just love it. It's a beautiful work, and it's so full of, um, it talks about time and the present moment and history, and it felt sort of conducive to this timeless stream that we have in front of us. Um, and the, the idea of writing the four quartets or having them be written or rewritten by just random people anywhere around the world by talking about what they were having for breakfast, contributing a word out of context, I found that really intriguing. Um, and on top of all that, T.S. Eliot really basically called Twitter, like back in 1935. <laughs> That's for real. That's right out of the four quartets. So what, I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just going to break out for one second here, because I've been talking about a river and words and blah, blah, blah. But just to give, I started building this at the beginning of the talk. And so this is an example of a segment of the four quartets that is just currently being written off of Twitter right now. So this is real time, um, word by word, words that are lost um, just show up in a, in a lost word. And you can just track this. And if we did it again in 
20 minutes, it would be a different set of tweets, it would be different people, but it would be the same poem. So I just wanted to show you that so you know what, what I'm talking about. So, uh, my question was, are the four quartets on Twitter? And I jumped up at 4 a.m. and spoiler alert, the four quartets are on Twitter. I wrote a little Ruby prototype, super quick, just a, just a big, messy for loop. But it was super exciting just to see parts of this work that I love be recreated in front of my eyes. You could mouse over and see the tweet. And you can see words that um, aren't found or words that have sort of fallen out of our language that, oops, uh, <laughs> show up in this column. Are and it was. You're just analyzing tweets that are coming in. Yeah, just analyzing tweets that are coming in. Not, mm -hmm. not ones that are just leaving the column. Nope. Mm -mm. No, so just like what's happening right now. Um, yeah. So this, this first thing was just a gigantic for loop. It hit Twitter. Twitter was super generous back in the day. It was like, search me however much you want. I don't care. And then it drew words on a web page. It was very simple. But the thing is, I liked the project. I found it compelling. And I wanted to keep working on it. And I realized that if I was going to keep working on it, I would need to have something a little bit, um, something a little bit better than what I had done initially. Like I had a prototype, but I needed a project. And so I went back to the drawing board again with Ruby. and. I focused on splitting the different behaviors of the domain into their own applications. So I thought of it as having two pieces, a skimmer, which would take care of searching and parsing a poem, and a scribe, which would do the writing to the client. And what I did was I just made two small, independently running applications. I ran them up on Heroku. Um, skimmer was made up of a bunch of classes that handled processing a poem and sending messages, and the scribe would figure out what data, what the content type of the data was that had been sent, and then figure out what to do, to do from it. Um, and it was much better than the first sort of stab at it. But there were some things that jumped out at me, which were I was thinking of these uh, applications sort of like processes, but they were relying on a third-party vendor for their inter-process communication. So they were sharing the state that they were getting through PubNub. And so what happened if that vendor fails, or one of the applications fails, or what even if I wanted to say, instead of drawing the words like one by one, like spin them up all at once, or look for lost words at the same time. And so it was all doable, but I would have had to look for concurrency libraries in Ruby. And basically, I was, I, I, while I had a cleaner prototype, I felt like I was working in a language that wasn't the best fit for the problem domain. So I needed a different paradigm. <laughs> and it's, I, I, instead of separate applications, applications, I wanted to have separate processes. And at that point, enter Erlang. <clears throat> I don't know who drew this coffee cup, but it's super nice. <laughs> it looks very professional. I found it on Google. Um, so I had heard about Erlang, and it seemed like the instincts that I was having for what I, how I wanted the application to work were things that you get for free with Erlang. So, because that's how Erlang says you should build applications. So you have separate processes that scale independently. Each process has its own copy of the data. There's fault tolerance built in. Um, processes can access other data without causing race conditions, and it's very easy to communicate back and forth between processes. Um, and I wanted to learn something new. I've been programming for a long time. In my last job, I was working in Python. And then before that, for about seven years, um, I was using Ruby, both standalone Ruby, Rails, Sinatra, its other frameworks. I've worked in Objective-C. I've worked in JavaScript. And then before that, I had a, there was a very esoteric language I worked in. It started with a P and ended with HP. <laughs> um, and in those languages, I've been very focused on sort of traditional object-oriented designs in the sense, in the sort of traditional sense of modeling nouns and their relationships to each other. And the applications that I've worked on have been to a large degree database-backed web applications that model business flow. Um, though, you know, with everybody else in the last few years, I've been moving towards a, an SOA model and sort of grappling with how do we take our current patterns of coding and put them into distributed systems with lots of different components. Um, but it, it was very easy on some level to just swap in any of those languages for another and just look at different, different libraries and different syntax. Um, 
so for me to look at a functional programming language that was built around concurrency, messaging, and fault tolerance, it was a new paradigm for me, and I was very excited to dive in. The coffee cup on the left is just a logo from a coffee shop. <laughs> no, it's like Elixir Coffee. <coughs> Elixir Coffee and an Erlang logo. Um, and I, I wanted to put this up. So I, I, I've never actually looked at Elixir to this date, but when I started the project, uh, people said to me like, oh, you should think of learning Elixir because it would be easier and it has a much more Ruby-like syntax. And I have to say that, that that didn't sit well for me. And it's not because anything bad about Elixir. I've heard wonderful things. But I felt like if I'm going to use something that looks like the thing I already know, right? and if that's why I use it, this looks like the thing I already know, then I'm going to sort of start to try to solve problems the way that I already know how. <laughs> um, and even if I consciously don't want to, I'm going to feel comfortable enough to sort of think in familiar patterns. And so, um, and I also kept hearing, well, Erlang syntax is ugly and it's weird. You should use Elixir because Elixir kind of takes that away. And that's great. But in a similar vein, I thought if I'm going to choose a language for the reason that it hides or masks an ugly, weird syntax, it would sort of be like sleeping on a bed with a monster underneath it, right? Like, I, I would build Erlang up into something that was really big in my mind and, and that I was deliberately avoiding. Um, it, would be, it would become this unapproachable thing. Um, and again, it's nothing against Elixir, but I really wanted to, my thinking is that when you, when you pick up something new, and if it's unfamiliar, if it's an unfamiliar idea, just go and be unfamiliar with it. Like, dive into that unfamiliarity with it, because even though it might make you slower and stuck and all of those things, that unfamiliarity is going to help shape the way you think, and it'll make it much harder for you to think, yeah, I already know what I'm doing. I'm already here. Um, and then also, it appealed to my sort of tough side, because there's, like, there's a mystique around Ur uh, Erlang, right? It's the applications are built in a different domain than the ones I'm used to, and it scales to two bajillion processes a nanosecond. Like, it's just like really crazy, and people are opinionated about the syntax, and it's like, I want to do that. That sounds, that sounds awesome. Um, I wanted to dive into these new and different shapes and see how they affected my thinking. So before we get to what the code did, I just wanted to look at the shapes of it. So here are three Erlang files. Some are mine and some aren't. And don't, it doesn't matter what they do. I tried to make them small so it didn't matter. But the exercise that I would ask you to do and that I did is sort of squint at it and just see what you see by the shapes of the words on the page. And so when I squint at it, and I, what do I see? I see groups of similar looking code, right? I see a lot of code that has the same name but then different arguments. Um, there's, there's a list-like terminology that's, that has, that's there. <laughs> Uh, a sort of circular self-referential syntax. And so, okay, if you don't know anything at all, what might you get from these, these patterns? And I could say, well, Erlang looks like it uses patterns of similar code. And it seems like what was really interesting to me is that the logic in this application is effectively a first-class citizen. Like, you, you encode your logic into your code rather than sort of building up a function and then inside it putting a bunch of different logical statements. So that's interesting. And that's, that's a flexibility. That means you can think with your logic right away. Um, it makes a lot of statements. It's sort of very declarative. So I, I'm, you might get other things, but that's, just, that's what I got from looking at the shapes. Um, then this is the, a parallel. This is the same thing. It doesn't matter what it does, but it's three Ruby files. And again, if you just look at it, what do the shapes show? So one of the first things that I notice is that in, in the Erlang code before, everything was left aligned. And in this code here, you only have a couple things left aligned, and everything else is a little bit indented. And what that says to me is, well, there's, there's overriding groupings, some kind of conceptual groupings, and inside of them are pieces of smaller stuff. <laughs> Um, there's also assignment. So if you're reading the page from top to bottom, you see values being assigned to things. You can say, okay, well, this, this code assigns values first. 
Um, other things, the chunks are, they're, they're kind of cute, right? They're short and sweet. They're, the words are Englishy, and it's sort of fun to read. Um, so what, what might that tell us if we knew nothing about the language? Um, well, you could say, well, this language uses classes and methods. Maybe it's just encoded into the shapes. The units of work are small and manageable. It seems to be optimized for human reading. It's just kind of very, it has a very English feel to it. Um, so it's not, what I'm saying, it's not entirely fair because now I've programmed in both of these languages so I could be saying, well, I, I know these things and now I'm retroactively putting them onto the shapes. But it's, the shapes are clearly different. And I think it would be interesting, so next time you're thinking of learning a new language, just before you even get into it, just kind of squint and read some code in it for a while and jot down, like, what do you think that says or what might that indicate? And then work in it for a while and see, were you right, were you wrong, what else was hidden, etc. I think it's just a neat exercise in thinking differently. Um, okay, I have to address this. <laughs> I kept hearing it. Erlang is weird, it's ugly. And first of all, like, why... <laughs> Like, what do we mean when we say something, a language in this case, is weird or ugly? And I feel like there are two, two a couple of ways to think about this. And one is a visual impact, right? So is the language concise? Is it verbose? So for example, in Erlang, there's a, there's a lot of punctuation that's used just as symbols in the language. Um, Ruby uses almost no punctuation at all, so there's a difference. Punctuation symbols can kind of break up a stream of thought, perhaps. They could make a code feel cluttered instead of clear, if you were going to use those words, or dense instead of not dense. <laughs> <laughs> and dense code can be harder to read, so that might be one reason that people have that reaction. But I think a more important one has to do with comfort zone. And I think when, whenever we're confronted with something that, we, that is unfamiliar, not easy, it's counterintuitive or confusing, we have a natural, you want to push it away and say, well, that's weird, it's ugly, I don't get it, it's because it's not in your sort of lexicon of thinking. Um, maybe something exposes different ways of doing things than you're used to, or when you look at it right away, you don't have that moment where you're like, I get it. You look at it and you say, I don't know. Um, or maybe it's you have an expectation, an implicit or, expect, or explicit expectation that has been breached. And so I think these are all things to think about when you say, when you hear that or find yourself thinking about that as a language. So I wanted to show you one quick example of an expectation of mine that was breached, which has to do with string processing in Erlang. And this was a case I was just trying to, I was going over a data structure and trying to come up with a very simple list of ints. <laughs> Right, I just wanted a list that said 34, 35, 36, 37, and my expectation and the way I thought of this was, well, this is very simple. And I ran my code and I got that string on the top, like backslash quote, hash, dollar, percent, ampersand, single quote. It wasn't even a list. <laughs> and, and it, yeah. <laughs> And it makes, it's expected in Erlang. And I learned like all ASCII character values are identical to integers. <coughs> and strings of characters are identical to lists of integers. So the way that I was writing this, like 34 is the backslash or the single quote. I'm not sure if that's escaped. Yeah, it's a quote, it's escaped, right, right, right. But when you first see that, when I first saw that, and you, I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> and I will say in fairness that when I had to do string parsing in Erlang, I did often wish I was in a different language. Um, oops. On the other hand, what, what do you say, what makes someone say, oh, this language is elegant or beautiful, which is actually how I feel about Erlang now, and which is a complete shift. When I started, I was like, ah, and now I love it. And I would say, well, it matches your expectations, so things, things make sense. You, you can fit pieces together in a way that's understandable. Uh, the way that you think about the problem matches the solution. And using a tool feels simple, just like an extension of thought, like it should be this way. The way that I'm going to do it, this is how it should be. Um, and a couple examples, so for me now, like there's nothing that I find more elegant than, than starting a function with a base clause and then working up clause by clause with different clauses. And again, it reminds me of, Sarah, what you were showing in your talk with the, um, 
I forget what it was, but the, the two function clauses, which were different, because it makes sense if you think about it. You're in the same domain. You're working in the same function, but it's in different contexts every time. So after a while, that just seems like a really elegant solution. You can also ignore the data by using underscore. So every time you're uh, looking at a function, you can just have a different context. Um, the same thing with function arities, that you can have the same function name with different numbers of arguments. And it's a similar thing. You're in the same domain, but doing slightly different things. Um, and ditto recursive list processing. So again, at the beginning, list, list processing is counterintuitive. You don't have your little I or your J. You're not going I plus plus, <coughs> J plus plus. Um, but lists are really like Russian nesting dolls, in a way. And recursive processing exposes the structure of the list instead of just magically giving you what the next element is. Um, you don't have those messy little variables. You don't have to use each. And it's very clear what happens at every phase the list is in. And I just think, wow, that's super beautiful. Who knew? But it took quite a while to, to get there. Um, so anyway, back to, my, back to my story. I decided to learn Erlang. So I did read a bunch of books, which were great, and did all the tutorials, which was time consuming, but great. And um, then I watched a movie. <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is the Erlang movie. That's what it's called. And it's amazing. And they talk to each other on the telephone. <laughs> um, yep. And I decided to build an OTP application. Because it, it seemed like what's the rec that, that's the recommended approach. And I liked what I was learning about it. Because you get a bunch of predefined behaviors that you implement. And OTP feels to me a little bit like Legos in that you get components and you, and, um, that you can take and build with. And there are a few patterns you have to follow, how you start your app, how you parameterize your supervisors. Um, but it doesn't feel as heavy handed as some frameworks like, for example, Rails or other frameworks like that, which feel a little bit more like they're saying, well, this is how you build your app. Here's where all the pieces go. Um, do it. And OTP says, well, how, here's, how, here's how you start your application. Here's a bunch of behaviors that are awesome and will take care of things for you. Um, figure out how to fit your functionality in and now go. And so to me, it feels a little bit more like emergent design with um, just by which I mean like a set of rules and entry points than, than a framework. And it's very lightweight. There's not a database layer backed in and it's built for scaling and fault tolerance. So, I'm a new, new Erlanger, but um, this was the boxes and arrows for my first OTP application. So it's composed of the application entry point, a word ordering server, so that you could say, well, order the words from the beginning to the end of the poem, or the end to the beginning, or all at once. A few supervision trees that would search for words or search for lost words. Utility code for connecting to Twitter, which I will talk about more in a few slides. And gen event um, for broadcasting and handling events. And I, I have to say, because I've heard people scoff at gen event, and I think I've even heard someone once call it evil. But I don't know why. <laughs> and it was great for my application, because it allowed, like at every stage of the application, pro pro uh, processes could broadcast events. <coughs> and you can hook up specific types of handlers. So you can say, this handler is focused entirely on sending data to PubNub, or this handler is focused entirely on keeping track of the current state of the poem, which means a web page could reload in the middle and get the full thing again. You could hook up a new client, and it would always know where it was. Um, and so remember, with my Ruby application, I used Pub, uh, PubNub as my inner process communication. But here, inner process communication comes for free. That's what Erlang is built to do. It's designed to send and receive messages between processes. Um, and here's a, you know, a more accurate view. Did you guys use the observer? I, I discovered it and I love it. It's a way to see your application as it's running. Like, what are your processes? What are they doing? And this, is, this shows my application supervision tree in two different states. What processes are spawned when I'm searching for a word and what processes are spawned when a word is being lost. And I just found this, this whole observer to be a great way to understand what my app was doing and also to remind me to name my processes. Because I'm like, <laughs> oh, 043, wait, what? And then I'd go back and name it and get another screenshot. And 
Um, yeah. And so here's just a couple views. So this is a view of, that I had that shows words that are being searched for and not found, or if they're crossed out, it means they were found. Here's a screenshot of a segment of the poem that's been drawn. Um, and I will say that one thing I learned that was very unexpected is that there is a lot of porn on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> like actual, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so what did I get with Erlang and OTP? I got one repo with different processes. I got supervision trees, gen servers, and other behaviors, fault tolerance, um, concurrency, the ability to swap out behavior, and e it's easy to build new views. So when I was preparing this talk, Garrett suggested that I name it Massively Scaling T.S. Eliot. And I would have loved to have named it Massively Scaling T.S. Eliot. Because as I said at the beginning, my idea is just pulling poetry off of Twitter in real time, like as fast and furious as you can get. So I absolutely would have loved to name it, loved to name it Massively Scaling T.S. Eliot. But... Uh, Twitter in 2016 is not your grandmother's Twitter. <laughs> um, in the intervening years since I had done a prototype, it had just really tightened the screws on how you can access the data. So I have an Erlang OTP application that has the power to massively scale T.S. Eliot, and it is basically because of Twitter's rate limiting, <laughs> I have built a giant for loop with a sleep in it. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> um, so Twitter, rate limits. It rate limits like crazy. It didn't do this before. You used to be able to get just like 2,000 words, just search all you want. It was great. But now um, you can only get so many searches per user per every 15 minutes. And what this means is you can't build poems fast. And if you exceed your search quota, you receive an error, and eventually you get blocked. So it really means that no matter what your software can handle, you're limited to the number of keys that you have and their rate limited ceilings. So um, between Corey and myself, we had about 10 sets of authorized Twitter keys just from whatever, Toy Project 1 or Toy Project 2, and which isn't enough to go fast, but it was enough to kind of get me through development and buy some space and time. Um, and I want to take an aside for a second and just talk about GenServer, because GenServer is one of the OTP behaviors, and it's the way that I structured using the different keys was to implement a server that manages them. So you ask it for a key, it gives you the most current one. It, it doesn't, again, doesn't solve rate limiting or anything like that. It just keeps track of the next available key set and puts the most recently used one or the one that got rate limited on the back of the queue. It's just a circular queue. queue. But it, it provides global accessors to a singleton state. And um, what's super cool about it is if you look here, like I barely wrote any, like I put the keys in there and a little bit of logic for get current keys, but basically I get all of this for free because this is how GenServer is built. If I, had, if I had written something like this in Ruby, I would have made a class with accessors, but it would be vulnerable to race conditions. Um, and I would have had to manage if different requests came in on different threads. So I just, GenServer, this is again is a super simple implementation of it, but it was a wonderful tool to have in the toolbox. Um, I'm going to talk a, a minute about other Twitter <laughs> detours specifically because I ended up spending a lot more time writing code in Erlang to support what I needed from Twitter than I expected. When I worked with Ruby, they were like, here, here's a library. It's called Twitter <coughs> something. And it just did things simply, and it abstracted it. And I think I wrote, like, Twitter.search. Like, I didn't have to think about any of that at all, which might also be a difference in the communities and libraries. Um, but that, that's the case. But... But when I started this, I couldn't find a lot of existing libraries for the functionalities that I needed. And so I ended up spending a lot of time writing code to handle these functionalities myself, which was neat because it got me deeper into Erlang. But it was also like, whoa, I'm off on this crazy detour doing something I hadn't planned to do. For example, OAuth. <laughs> so you know, if we talk about like I wasn't that excited about string processing in Erlang, I, at the time I was doing this, Twitter had just recently been like, hey, now you always need to use OAuth. And the Erlang libraries I found, I think I found one that was like, we're starting working on this. But at any rate, it wasn't done, or I couldn't find it. And I was like, OK, well, I'm going to have to write this. So I ended up writing a little Twitter OAuth library in Erlang, um, which was a crazy thing, uh, and figuring out how to see my SSL requests. Because you make them, it's hard to see. How do you see what's going wrong? Um, and it taught me a lot about string processing in Erlang. 
and now I have an OAuth library. <laughs> um, and the next roadblock was, was rate limiting. And so when you make, it was related to rate limiting. So when you make uh, an HTTP REST call to Twitter, you just get back a full tweet. You're like, search for car, and it's like, here it is, the whole tweet with car. But you don't want to make a lot of REST calls because of rate limiting, and so what you need to do is connect to their stream API, which lets you keep open a long-running connection for a set of terms. But when you have this long-running connection open for a set of terms, you don't get back a full tweet. You get back like, here's a full tweet, or here's the middle of a tweet, or here's the beginning or here's the end of one with the beginning of another or something. Like, here, go. And it's up to you as the developer to say, well, how do I build these into a full tweet? So I had to spend a lot of time um, doing string parsing with binary strings, which was crazy. And I just wanted to throw up some of the tests that I wrote just to confirm I was constructing <coughs> tweets correctly out of these random chunks of binary strings. And I ended up spending a lot of time how do you do matches? How do you do regexes in these things? Um, and it worked, but as I mentioned before, Erlang is not built for easy string processing. <laughs> um, at any rate, so I want to look at the two approaches side by side, the app comparison. So in Erlang OTP, there is one application with many processes. They don't share state, and you have built-in OTP behaviors. In Ruby, I had, I'm just going to say, two separate applications. And by, I put it in quotes, because if I wanted another one, it would have been three or four. Um, the process is shared state, um, and I ended up writing a lot of custom classes in Ruby. There's a very much, this is great, but there's very much culture of program by wishful thinking that's part of the Ruby community. So you just sort of write what you want it to do, which is great. I love that approach, but it's very different from being an OTP and thinking, well, how do I fit this into a gen server? Does that make sense? Um, so... One of the biggest paradigm shifts for me, which was, was going from working with objects to processes. And so there are a few reasons for that. So first of all, Erlang applications tend to scope themselves or talk about themselves in terms of lots and lots of concurrent processes. Whereas we don't say in Ruby or Python, oh, I'm going to create a million little objects and just use them all at the same time. Like if you did that, someone would say, well, it doesn't sound like a very good design. It sounds like it might slow down or crash your program. Um, so when it was first suggested that I use a single process for every word, I, I felt like, well, that's really wasteful. Like a word is tiny. Why would you use a whole process for it? Um, but, and that's the beauty of it, is a process is meant to just do a small individual chunk of work. And you can think of it, and I don't know if this stands or not, but you can think of it in a way like a piece of a for loop in that it starts with some state, it executes a task, and then it exits. But it doesn't then, unless it's supervised explicitly to start again, it's, it's just done its work and gone. Um, another difference in Erlang or with processes is that they are often explicitly managed with supervisors, whereas in Ruby land, we didn't have that. And we have patterns for creating objects. You have the factory pattern, et cetera. But you don't have this idea of of life cycle. And to me, Erlang processes have this very organic, living, breathing feeling to them. They feel more like cells than like, than like cars. And this, this is a screen from an OO training video. Um, and it's obviously basic, but everybody's seen something like this, right? Like, we, everybody's been introduced to OO in this manner at some point, which is um, visualizations for object-oriented programming tend to be very physical object-focused. Like, you have a thing, and the thing has facts about it. And the thing tends to be something that you recognize from your world, like a car or a refrigerator. Whereas this, this diagram, it's a little hard to see because it's dark, but this is a screenshot from a video walking through an Erlang visual visualizer. And you don't see things here. You see relationships and state. And so it's just a different sort of conceptual entry point. Um. <laughs> and interestingly, <laughs> just because we're taught object-oriented programming by learning how to model cars and refrigerators, the coiner of the term had a much different idea in mind. And when you watch this this keynote, there are so many things he says in it that feel to me like, oh my god, you're describing Erlang. Like, for example, he talks 
he first says he wishes he had used the term process-oriented instead of object-oriented, which right away is super interesting. And he says, Westerners focus so much on nouns, and the Japanese have a word, which is ma, M-A, that represents the space in between things. Um, he says he thinks of objects as like biological cells or individual computers on a network, and they're only able to communicate with messages, right? It sounds sort of familiar. He says every object is a virtual server, server with its own URL and IP address. Again, very similar. So it was super fascinating. Um, but even if you can argue that Erlang is like the lost OO, it's really not how we were trained on it and mostly how we work on it. What? <laughs> um, one of the hardest things for me as a, I'm just going to say, OO programmer to think about in Erlang was state. And it, it really threw me for a loop because I think in reflecting, in OO state, the concept of state is so baked into the entities that we model that I don't think of it as its own entity. Like you have a car, your car is blue. It just is. It just is blue. And even the way that you access it in the code, usually like car.color, it just feels like there's not a lot of lines between the entity and its state. And suddenly Erlang, you have, there are no instance variables, no accessors, and you have this thing called state or new state, um, which is the internal state of your gen server process that just gets passed around. And I'm actually embarrassed to admit, it took me a really long time before I was like, oh wait, I don't have to call it state. Like, I can call it. <laughs> it was so foreign to me. And I was like, oh, I can just call it. It's just the thing. It's searchable. It's just the thing. It's the data. But it was so different. Um, you know, shared state can be a problem in OO. Oops. But um, I was trying to come up with metaphors just to help myself think about, like, what's the difference between state in, functional, in this functional programming language and state in object-oriented languages? And one of the things I felt like was that state was kind of like a baton in a relay race that a process is running with itself. And maybe the baton changes every time, like, now it's on fire, now it has a bird or whatever, but it's just like it gets passed along. And you can think of an individual process as a state machine, right? And every time it does something, it has a new state or its state is unchanged, and then it just waits for the next event. But it's basically this passing, the cycling of state, which is intrinsically different from just being something, again, like a blue car. Um, one other metaphor that helped me was thinking about state as a backpack. <laughs> For, from the perspective of an individual process. It's, it's something different than itself that it carries along with it. These, they don't share their backpacks, they each have their own. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're child processes. Oh my God, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I got so close, three small processes. And I, oh, beautiful. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Oh my God, I love that. Um, anyways, again, the distinction between being something and having access to something or carrying something around. Um, and while from the outside it may have the same effect if you're working with the programmer as a uh, working with the program as a developer, it's really it was a big paradigm shift and it was a stumbling block for me. Um, so yeah, basically thinking in Erlang to me had a lot to do with decoupling, like decoupling state from methods, decoupling processes from each other, and then finding clean ways they can communicate, decoupling the scaling of an individual process from the scaling of an application at large, and decentralizing data. Um, and so, well, <laughs> whispering. So anyway, I just, where, where do I wanna go? Oh, five more minutes. Okay, so we're almost up. So um, for what I'd like to do with this project is build it up so that it can show all of the four quartets, which is hard because it's like 60 pages, um, but there's a lot of word work to do for that. As I said earlier, the one word at a time is slow. Um, there's a way on Twitter that you can search for multiple words at a time, but it's hard. It adds a lot of complexity um, because the words don't necessarily come in in sequence and you don't want that. So I took a stab at building a multi-term search with some linked processes, but a lot of challenges that come up is like, when do you know if a word is lost? Like, if a word is found, can you display it? Because what if you found word eight, but you haven't found word three? Like, then what do you do? So um, 
This is a work in progress. I'm looking, trying to figure out how to use these linked processes versus supervision trees, et cetera, but I haven't figured it out yet. I'm excited to be here with so many great Erlang people to get their input. And um, sort of that wraps it up. In summary, I would say Erlang is awesome. <laughs> I've come to love it. I find it super beautiful. It's helped me shape a lot of ways of thinking. Um, and I feel really lucky I have a specific project that's driving me to like, well, if I want to do this feature, I have to figure it out. So um, that's it. I feel very honored to be here speaking at this conference with people. And thank you so much. <laughs> And this is where the poem got to. Um, uh, so I'll just, if you just repeat the, okay. yeah, you keep that. Okay. Any questions? Um, I'm curious now that you've learned Erlang yeah. and you also have a background in movies mm -hmm. and you desire to check out and like sort of see where that fits in the spectrum. Yeah, I think I do. I, I don't have a desire to switch, but at this point it would seem silly to not check it out. Like when at the beginning I was like, no, I don't want to do that, and these are my reasons, I think it would start to feel just as equally weird to say, well, I don't want to look at that other thing. Erlang is the fire. <laughs> is that so for context, John is that your own copy? Wow. <laughs> it does calm the mind. Yeah. Do you have a list of some favorite lost words? Oh. Um, <coughs> I did not, but I would say, every, oh, the question is, did I have a list of some favorite lost words? And the answer is I didn't, but it was always fasc fascinating to watch what would come up. For a while, I would just do the same poem, and always the same words would be lost. Like, sometimes words are lost because they timed out, and then two seconds later, like, here's the word. It's the. But then words like ianthus or uh, diffident, like things that we just don't say anymore. And I think more than specific words, it's realizing, like, we don't, these words have fallen out of our language, and I could be stuck here at this point forever because nobody's going to say that. Show you the mapping cart algorithm. <laughs> okay. Awesome. One more question. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you don't have one. Yes. <laughs> It is not, not for any philosophical reason, just because it's a bunch of functions on my laptop. It's like all the Twitter live people be quite What? All Twitter live people be quite Yeah, I, it could be. I mean, that would be something to do with it for sure. It was one of the earlier things I wrote, so it's sort of messy. It works, but it's, I would want to clean it up, but it, I could put it out. Yeah. And of course, Alan Kay said the, the big idea is messy. Yeah. It's all the rest is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, I'm also fascinated by some people like one night. Yeah. 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 yeah, it is very subjective. Well, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>